it is a topic that's very near and dear to me. And uh, it's actually the most important thing because, you know, we keep hearing about, oh, I closed this deal. I've got these many units and all of that's nice. But the real work starts happening once you close the deal, because now you have to execute on the business plan. And literally millions of dollars, this is not hyperbole, millions of dollars can be made or lost overnight because the decisions you take today have ramific multiple ramifications tomorrow, the day after, the month after, and the years after. And eventually the decisions we take today are, or the decisions we take every week, they have an effect when we're trying to sell the asset. Whether, by the way, it's in a good market or a dodgy market, right? So this is why this is very, 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 very important. Okay. So like just about anything else done at a high level, this presentation is about specializing in asset management, right? I could have offered coaching or courses or just purely try to raise equity. But instead, I focused on the property management companies in each of the markets target. I began to understand the operations on a level above everyone else. I'm going to peel back the curtain and show you how we operate our properties on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. But one last thing before I get into this. Everybody and their grandma in this industry has basically the same ebook with the same tired slogans like, hey, don't worry about toilets, termites, and tenants. And let me tell you this. This is the perfect example of just a shallow statement, you know, from low level thinkers who have no concepts on actually day to day executing on an extremely successful multifamily apartment business plan. So real quick, if you take away just one thing away from this talk today, right? You're going to banish the word tenant from your vocabulary. You're never gonna use it again. In fact, from here on out, we are going to be talking about our residents, building a community of our happy residents who pay rent rain or shine, 10 to 20% yearly raises in their rent and during a worldwide pandemic, by the way. We have done deals together during the pandemic where we never, ever, ever stopped paying distributions while most other sponsors stopped. So if you want a subtitle for the presentation, I don't really think it's asset management. It should more be resident satisfaction, right? All right, so let's get started, right? You, you see me, that handsome guy right over there is Omar, me. I'm the speaker. I've advised on $3.7 billion in capital financing and M&A transactions on the institutional side. My portfolio is over $200 million right now in development and acquisitions spread out across Texas, Georgia, Florida, and South Dakota. And the reason why I'm highlighting all of this is that by the time I started syndicating, I had, it wasn't a career change for me. I was actually running portfolios, running deals on the institutional side for 10 plus years. So, uh, by the time I actually started, you know, formally working under my own company, there was a lot of trials, errors, tribulations, and experiences that had, that had gone into actually building uh, the company that you see today and having all these great relationships that I had. This is just to give you an idea of our transaction history. As you can see, a lot of it is value add focused across the states that I mentioned to you. Started off in Texas, did a couple of deals in Florida, Georgia, South Dakota. Most of it's value add, a couple of classes, a few developments. The point here is that I've always emphasized what matters to us, both as general partners, syndicators, but also to you as investors, isn't really the picture of the property, right? Because I see a lot of people get hung up on, oh, I just do class A or I do class B or I want to do this. The point of this entire exercise is when you understand asset management, when you understand how to take a data-driven approach, it doesn't matter what asset you're in. It doesn't matter what class of asset you're buying because you can make money under all scenarios and all types of assets, but you have to know what levers to pull. And that's why I feel it's important to have the context before digging deeper, right? So a couple of things that I want you to understand is that what will we cover here, right? I understand most of you are going to want the hard data, right? So that's why we'll be looking at metrics and spreadsheets. We're gonna talk about that later. But the truth is guys, that if, I, if all I show you is spreadsheets, you're going to fall asleep no matter how much you insist that you're not, that's not gonna happen. Because eventually these things are kind of boring if you're just watching somebody do it, right? So what I'll also be doing is telling you some stories from the properties we managed to tie in these spreadsheets, these analytics to actual real world examples. And 
because this can kind of summarize the key concepts we talked about. Meaning you, you'll get a mixture of both the high level stuff, but also the nitty gritty, right? So a couple of the things that I'm going to talk to you specifically about is that your job as an asset manager is that you are the CEO uh, of this business plan. Think about it this way. If you buy a $40 million acquisition or it's a development, essentially you're the CEO of a $40 million business. So while it's very easy to say, hey, I have to literally look at every single thing. No, your job as a CEO is to have a team. You have to manage them by taking a deep analytical insight into your business. You have to manage via dashboards and key analytics. You have to take a deep dive into your rent role to understand the key drivers of revenue. And the reason why I emphasize the rent role as the key factor is because in my experience, a lot of people instinctively just veer towards, hey, I'm just going to cut expenses because that's pretty easy to do, right? I mean, you were paying somebody $10,000 last month. You say, I'm going to rah, 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 I'm going to cut expenses and you're going to pay them $8,000. And suddenly you can show on your books that you've saved $2,000. The problem with that approach is that as we all know, you can't cut, you can't just cut your way to prosperity. Austerity does not always lead to prosperity, right? And there's only so many of these expenses you can cut because eventually you need to be spending some amount of money, right? To run any business, any property, any household, any entity for that matter, right? But with the revenue, what you technically have is unlimited potential, right? With expenses, you kind of know how much you can cut eventually. But when you focus on the key drivers of revenue and driving that revenue growth, you basically, you're in a blue ocean and you have unlimited potential. But all of that revenue, the drivers of that revenue, it can only make sense when you're actually providing some level of a renovation plan, right? Presumably, because not a lot of people are gonna pay you the renovated unit rents if they don't get an additional benefit. So you will have to be managing a complex renovation program to ensure that your budgets are adhered to. And then there's a couple of steps in between. We're gonna go into it later. But then when you take these drivers of revenue, you manage your complex renovation plan, a couple of steps we're gonna talk about, then those key items are reflected in your PL. And if you've done all the work that we're gonna talk about today, your PL is basically a byproduct to showcase the maximum productivity you're gonna have. Got it? So this is just basically, you know, a big primer on what our asset management playbook is. Of course, uh, you know, we can't cover every single thing about operations in one presentation. So on this screen, you're gonna see how we present our overall asset management framework to our investors. You know, some of the stuff, like I said, on the last slide, we'll go over today. Uh, other stuff like being aggressive about paying, uh, the least amount of property taxes, reducing expenses. You know, this is common sense uh, that you're likely going to get at first glance. So I'm just showing you the slide for the sake of completeness, right? Just for you to get an idea. Uh, these are my top five rules. I really had to think about this because I, I say this to my team all the time, uh, but I, sometimes I use more colorful language and we got to keep this uh, PG, right? So it took me a little while to crystallize these. So as we approach the drier topics, what I'd like you to do is keep in mind that this is a set of five rules uh, that have sort of crystallized over the years to keep everyone drawing in the same direction. Because as I mentioned to you, if you buy a $40 million property, you're essentially running a $40 million business, guys. There's not a lot of people that are running $40 million business, not just in America, but in the world, period. So when you have a team, you need to make sure they're all drawing in the same direction and they've all agreed uh, on the top priorities, right? So number one, Stellar reputation and strong relationships. Uh, you could say, oh yeah, well, this kind of makes sense, but you would be very surprised that this is not just stellar reputation of you or your group to the outside world, which is brokers and other, uh, buy, uh, other owners of properties in the markets that you're in. This is also a reputation internally. How do you lead and manage your teams? How do you develop relationships with your team? Are you consistent in what you're saying or not? Because trust me, your employees are noticing you all the time, the same way as outside people, external people are noticing. And what I've noticed typically is that a lot of times, you know, people really present their best face, best, uh, you know, face to brokers, buyers, sellers, but internally their teams are in a disarray. So I always like to insist that having a very stellar reputation and developing strong relationships internally and externally is very important. And a lot of folks just focus on the external, not the internal. 
right? Secondly, the on-site team or the on-site teamwork makes dream work. And now this might be a pithy point, but the point here is, guys, you are the CEO, but the CEO is only as good as the team the CEO has compiled and how that CEO manages and motivates that team. Again, a lot of times what I'm seeing is people tend to view people in their teams, especially property managers, leasing agents, maintenance supervisors or techs, or even regionals in the property management firm as somewhat expendable. Because you know, a lot of these people aren't necessarily making, you know, the two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars. And people assume, hey, if this person doesn't work, I'm just gonna get a new person. And I'm gonna tell you, that's gonna create a lot of disruption. So you have to be very careful in not just the way what people you have on your property representing to you, because at the end of the day, they do represent you in front of your uh, you know, residents, but you also have to have an internal mechanism to motivate them, whether it's through bonuses, whether it's through verbal acknowledgement, you know, writing somebody a note from time to time. You would be so surprised at how small, thoughtful gestures how far they can take you, not just in life, but especially with your team. I mean, I've known a few people that I've been able to poach from other people purely because the other person there, mantra was, well, I'm paying you, so just go do my work and shut up, essentially. And and while you might think, okay, well, I'm never going to do it, there's a lot of employers out there that do because they think this person makes $45,000, $55,000, $60,000 a year. Why do I got to do it? Guys, I'm going to tell you this right now. If you're on-site property manager, and your leasing agent is not a rock star, literally a rock star, and not just in terms of them doing the work. They, they don't have a pleasant demeanor. They don't, they don't perform under pressure. They're not creative. No directive that you give, and no matter how analytical or data-driven you are, it is ever going to have any effect. Because if your on-site team is not A++, nothing is going to happen, Right? Third, know your rent roll inside out. As I said this earlier, a lot of people focus on the expense side of the equation because it's very easy to do. It's instinctive, right? Hey, I cut $2,000, great. A lot of people don't really, first of all, focus on the revenue side. And then they don't necessarily really take a deep dive into the rent roll, which I'm going to show you because, well, first of all, a lot of people don't take a deep dive period. People are lazy. But the other deal is, when you start seeing it in your rent roll, you see not just, hey, what is a summary right now? What does my trend look the next three, six, seven months? How have I performed in the past? That provides you a lot of basically actual actionable data, not just on what you are going to do, what you think you're going to do, but what has happened in the past. Because think about it this way. If your actual, basically, on-site team member says, you, you give a directive, we're going to take all of our leases to market, as an example, right? The market rent right, to burn the lost lease. You give that directive. Your on-site team is under pressure because they've not been empowered to make the right decision. They might be leasing a lot of these uh, units at market rent, but then you might have a bad debt issue. Or conversely, because you've not given clear directives and you've only had this very binary sort of directive, they might be waiting for this one person to come along who's going to pay them this mythical market rent, and your unit could be vacant for a month, two months, three months. I've seen this happen, right? So understanding your rent roll, both historically and going forward, is extremely important. Point four, you've got to manage your CapEx like your hair is on fire. And I don't say this to basically be dramatic. I say this because at the end of the day, you can manage your rent roll, but if you're not providing value, you're not renovating your units, you're not literally digging down to comparing your budgets, comparing what renovation plan do you have? What is the ROI that you've had on your budget? How long were your units sitting vacant? Till you don't have all of this data, right? you're going to be playing catch up all the time because your competition has this data. I mean, and by the way, all of this data is internal. You don't have to go to an external party to get this data, but you have to manage your CapEx like your hair is on fire. Guys, you have no idea how many syndicators I've seen because the market was going up. Their budget would say a million dollars. We're going to do say 60% of the units. We're going to spend $300,000 on the exteriors, right? And it turns out they spent $700,000 on the exteriors. They maybe done 20% off the units because they weren't keeping a track of their costs and ROI and all of that. And now basically they've spent all this money and they have nothing to show for it, right? So managing your CapEx like your hair is on fire. 
And lastly, delinquencies are evil. They are the work of the devil. Okay, so what I want you to understand, it's no use that you basically understand your rent roll inside out, you manage your CapEx like your hair is on fire, and then you have all these delinquencies in bad debt, right? What was the point of going through all this aggravation, all this work that your team did, and now you have a lot of bad debt to show for it? Because the problem with bad debt is, guys, that it's like a, it's like a cancer. You start off with one or two units. Before you know it, you're going to have five units, 10 units, 20 units. Because word spreads around very quickly in every single community. Hey, the manager is kind of soft. You can just tell them I'm going to pay them in two weeks and then say it again, I'm going to pay it in two weeks and they're not going to do anything about it, right? Then you also have to realize your team, that's the on-site team, they're humans at the end of the day. If all the residents that show up there to them either have an excuse or they grind them down of the time, then say by the time three or four or 5 p.m. rolls in and somebody comes in, they're just going to be tired, right? They won't be able to put their best foot forward and represent you in the way that you should be represented. So top five rules, stellar reputation and strong relationships. The on-site teamwork makes the dream work. Know your rent roll inside out. I cannot emphasize this enough. Manage your CapEx like your hair is on fire. And delinquencies, delinquencies are the work of the devil. Okay? Now, what you've got to realize is, guys, we're going to start taking a very deep dive into all of these factors. But what I want you to know is understand that if you don't follow these five rules, you're going to have a lot of problems. Okay? So just whether you want to write it down, you want to take a screenshot, take this. Remember this, this is what makes the drives the bulk of the returns in value add multi family. We're going to get into the dashboards in a second. Guys, just a couple of big dashboard principles you're going to see on uh, the slide. Look, what I'm going to show you now is I'm going to show you at a high level my dashboards and how I operate. But you've got to realize, guys, you've got to do the work for yourself. So there is no real estate certification or school or course, I guess, for this type of stuff. Uh, the proprietary dashboards that I will share are based on my decade plus of experience and deep analytical understanding of the multifamily business, right? So we're not going to get into legalese here. I'm not asking you guys to sign any NDA or anything like that. But out of professional courtesy, I would ask that you don't share my proprietary data-driven analysis outside this webinar. Now, guys, just remember on dashboard principles, you've got to, as I said, you're the CEO. You've got to manage via dashboards and key analytics. You've got your team to actually do, you know, the day-to-day -day stuff. You just have to trust but verify. KISS, which is the keep it simple, stupid, right? This is what James Carville told Bill Clinton in his first run for presidency, right? You've got to design for the lowest common denominator and ease of use. I know we have a very august body of very sophisticated people here, but you've got to realize... When you are the CEO and you've got these projects, you're dealing with a wide spectrum of people and it has nothing to do with the level of intelligence. It has everything to do with the fact that whether they are used to operating in the way you are used to operating or you want to operate, maybe they're not used to the software, right? Maybe they just have too many things on their plate. And if you tell them, hey, I want you to spend two hours a day doing this stuff, then they won't be able to do the job that they're hired to do. So that's why I say design for the lowest common denominator and ease of use. And this is something I see a lot of people not doing in their haste or in their eagerness to design the world's greatest spreadsheet, it turns into a Frankenstein monster. And for you as the asset manager, what I would focus on is picking ideally one key lever, right? There's always one lever in a deal there. You just kind of nail that. Um, most other pieces will fall into place, but maximum three key levers, because this is another area. I see a lot of people, they're very eager to show their chops to, you know, do every single thing in the business plan. And they have too many priorities. And when you give your team too many priorities, when you give yourself too many priorities, the problems start happening, right? Nothing ever gets done on time, or if it is getting done on time, it is at the cost of filling reports and not doing the actual work. And we don't want that to happen, right? All right, stepping in, what we're gonna talk about it, this is gonna be the framework, right? We start off with basically the rental. As I talked, you've gotta understand them, but you gotta understand all the stuff, right? Then you were gonna go to the CapEx, then the delinquency management. This is what I told you, right? You do the rental, you manage your CapEx, but you've got all these bad debt, it's gonna be a big problem, right? So we're going to talk about that. These are the dashboards. Then I'm going to talk about the meeting schedule. And in my opinion, what is the best way of keeping in touch with your team to understand what's going on, but not being overbearing. Because at the end of the day, guys, we've hired professionals. 
We want them to do the job. We want them to do a stellar job. So if they're spending all their time working for us or answering our emails, they can do the jobs, right? Now, what I'm going to be sharing with you are dashboards from actual properties that are operating right now. So that'll give you an idea, right? All right, stepping in. This is the rental analysis. So number one, this is for an actual property. This is called Pines of Lanier Rental. So PL is Pines of Lanier. This is an actual property. I have we closed it in, gosh, I think it was like February 15th or 19th or 16th of this year, sometime like that. So that's why you see it starts in February and it goes all the way to 615, which was a couple of days ago. I try to do this every two weeks. I have my analysts do this, right? So guys, typically what happens is, you know, whether you're using any sort of property management software, Jardi, RealPage, uh, Entrada, Appfolio, AMSI, the problem is we'll get a really nice looking PDF for a rental. But when you convert it into Excel, the formatting is all off, right? So it's very hard for you to actually run any sort of analytics. So number one, what you have to do is you've got to take the rental and you have to convert it into this. It's called a tabular format, right? This is what spreadsheets, if you have it in this format in a spreadsheet, what starts happening is that then you are able to write formulas. And I'm going to get into that. But what I wanted to explain was it's very important to lay out your data correctly. This is spreadsheet management one-on-one, right? So as you can see here, let me zoom in. I don't know how big everybody's screen is. You see, we have these units over here. We've got the various unit types because every property has various unit types. This is a standardized dropdown, right? So then, because the problem is, and you're gonna see a lot of these standardized dropdown is, because if you don't have a standardized document dropdown, somebody might write, Occupy. One day they might write occupied. The other day they might write something else, right? Or there might be a spelling error. So you just want for things, for items where you can standardize, you just put a drop down. It's very simple, right? Pretty easy to do. You press enter, good to go, right? This gives you us the market rent. This gives us the IPR is the in place rent, right? And you could just call it rent, I, I guess, right? The loss to lease. Now, please remember all of this, these highlighted columns. They're from the rental. This is where the first set of calculations comes in, right? This is a loss to lease. The loss to lease, for those that don't know, is merely the difference between the market rent and the actual rent a uh, uh, sage unit is being charged. Think about it this way. In this case, right now, as of 6-15-2022, the market rent was $1,160 for this particular unit type. And the in-place rent was $650. That's what we're charging. Now you would think to yourself, gosh, what kind of idiot would have such a big loss to lease? Well, the issue is guys, that you see this lease, this lease, this is on a month to month. And this lease was signed, not month to month, but this lease was signed here. You see this, 2014, this is when this lease began. So the previous ownership, this is where we specialize in finding these gems. The previous ownership, just hadn't pushed rents. And that's great news for us, right? Because now when this lease expires, we can actually push the rents here, right? So this kind of gives you an idea, right? You see this all the way. For each unit number, each unit type, we have the status. Then we have what is the market rent? What is the in-place rent or the actual rent being charged? This gives us an idea of the, what the loss to lease is. And this is a very important concept. And the reason why, for instance, this is conditionally formatted, I haven't gone and done this. So as an example, what you can do with conditional formatting for those that don't know, it, this is available in uh, Excel as well, but if you're using Google Sheets, and I'll tell you why I use Google Sheets, right? If you highlight this, you go to format, uh, format you go to conditional formatting, you can apply various types of color scales if you like, or individual colors. Now, in this case, why I have chosen this color scale is because uh, the worse the number, you see the lower, the more the negative a number is. So 606 loss to lease is worse than 300 loss to lease. This means that we have a lot more room to capture here, right? So this is worse. This is not a good thing for us. I mean, it's an opportunity, but right now it's worse, right? So that's why I wanted to tell you why this is. Now, these particular charges, water, trash, CAM is a community uh, access fee, month to month, if somebody's month to month, like for instance, this unit is, pest, pet rent, concessions, employee, um, you know, somebody's just employee rooms, right? These are all taken directly from the rent roll. Similar, by the way, to how 
the market rent and the rent, the in-place rent is taken. Now, why do you want these there? Because one part of running your operations is, or water in this case also, one part of you running your operations is pushing up the rent, right? But a good asset manager has to focus on revenues from multiple angles. This is why I said it's very important to understand the revenue aspect of the game, right? Because rent is one aspect, but when you start adding all of these fees, right? You see, things start adding up. So if you look at it, if I just sum up all of this, I am just getting an additional $9,605 a month just by adding all of these fees. And you would think, well, 9,000, I don't know if that's not a lot of money, but you see, you go 9,000, 10,000, 20,000, these things start ramping up and adding up, right? So just wanted to explain to you, these items come from the rent roll. Basically, you're going to get from the property management software. But the reason why it's important for you to add these over here is, so then you start understanding, okay, where is the room here? As an example, think about it this way. This unit, which is a loft B, we're charging, they're getting charged $35 a month, right? This loft B is getting charged $40 a month for water right? So when we go through our rental, we're going to start understanding, okay, next time around, this person's lease gets uh, expired, they're renewing it. First of all, we've got, we've got to move it to the market. Maybe we have to renovate the unit. Plus, we also have to push this fee forward, right? Think about it this way. This same unit type is getting charged $7 a month on trash, only getting charged $5. The other unit, same unit type, by the way, getting charged $5. This is getting charged an $11 cam fee because we, when we came in, a lot of these fees weren't there. Some of these were. So we have to now implement all of these fees, right? So just the implementation process takes a little while. So, hey, this $11 is being applied to all of these units. When these units become expired, we're going to start adding these. That's another, say, $22 right here. Now, this month to month, you're going to, we charge a fee for month to month. Month to month basically says that somebody's lease expires. And instead of signing, an, I'd say, an additional term, 12 months, 24 months, whatever it is, or eight months, 12 months, whatever it is, they will sign a month to month fee. So we say, okay, well, you are not signing a lease with us. So we're just going to increase your rent. We are going to charge you a fee called a month to month fee. And that's going to be a hundred extra dollars, right? That kind of gives you an idea. It's just good for us to track these things, right? You see this over here, you see this over here, right? Then pest control. This is another fee, right? I mean, ideally, the problem becomes that if you have one, think about this as, as a bed bugs issue, right? You have one unit where you have a bed bug issue. Now, bed bugs don't just get confined to one unit. They're going to spread out all over the property. Right. So when we have good pest control, that's going to be an expense for us. Right. But it's also a benefit we're providing our residents. So in this particular case, we're going to charge them a fee for this to ensure that we are adequately maintaining pest control because it is worthwhile for us and it's worthwhile for them. Pet trend, kind of self-explanatory. Concessions are, for instance, concession. There's no, I mean, there's, yeah, well, look, there's one concession here. I don't know why this is. This is an employee unit, I think. But apart from that, there is not a lot of concessions, right? Sometimes, look, we have to give concessions. Think about it this way. Maybe you're in a market where there's a lot of vacancies in your market. Or maybe you have a very long-term resident and their rent in this particular case is going to go up by $510. You might give them, say, a $100 concession and say, okay, this year we're going to take you up to $410 and next year you figure things out, right? Because it's better to have a good tenant stick around because they're going to take care of the property. They pay their bills on time. They're not a nuisance. They actually take care of everything. Then to have a very good tenant leave. And then so let's assume it takes, let's assume it took us a month to basically lease the unit. So yeah, we could have gotten $510 extra, but we also lost out on like $650 of income, right? So you always have to take these things into account, right? Employee, this is an employee discount. Some people get it, some don't. Now you look at total amenity fee, right? All this is, is this is just a sum of all the various fees that we charge. We just sum them up over here. Now on all the rentals, doesn't matter which property management software you're going to have, you're going to have a lease beginning date and a lease ending date. And for sometimes with the lease ends, what happened is in this case, it's 2016. This person's just been going on because the previous management wasn't a professional management. They hadn't updated records. So now that when professionals like us come in, we can then basically really start, you know, the next time this lease expires, we can really start making sure all the data is clean. Now, I have these particular four 
um, to see this four is basically formulas. And I'm going to show you why I have these. So these, I mean, essentially all this is, is the least beginning month was the eighth month of the year, right? And the least beginning year was 2014, so on and so forth. I have this as a formula. I'm going to show you why this is. I just want you to know this is a formula, right? Similarly, term. What I want to understand is ideally everybody says we want long-term tenants uh, or residents, sorry, see, shouldn't use the word tenants. The reason why we want to measure this term is because a lot of times what happens is there is a sweet spot between having residents stay for short periods of time, which increases our costs, but residents staying for too long. Because typically when residents stay for too long, their rents are grossly under market, right? Because they're just not used to paying market rent. So you always have to manage your term and there is no magic formula, right? There is no like, hey, if it's 40, it's this, if it's 20, it's that. But you just want to keep an eye out on this thing. The reason why you want to keep an eye out on this thing is to understand how is your rent roll structured. Now I'm going to go into a lot of details. So guys, what I've done over here is see when we've laid the data out properly here in a tabular format, which is very easy for us to write formula in, we have unique identifiers for our various floor plans, right? Studios, lofts, one by one loft. Loft is this is with the balcony. This is with the patio. This is a two by one. We have our square feet as well, right? Typical stuff, how many of these units do we have? How many of these are vacant? What is our occupancy per unit, uh, unit type? Because it's not it's no use for us to say our occupancy is 98 or 99 or 95. We also have to see this on a per unit type. Then over here, we find out what is the average that we're charging per unit type for water, for trash, for camp. This is basically how many units are we charging these on, right? Not what is the average dollars. Those are over here, right? The reason why we want to know is because for all these headline items or as many of these as possible, we want them to match the total unit count. As an example, all the units should be, barring say less vacants, vacants should be paying the water charges. All the units, my barring vacants should be paying the trash, the cam, if there's some units in month to month pest, all of these units have to pay. And when you compare it as a time series, say, let's assume you go to 223. So pest is 78, right? Maybe this has to be a different number. Hopefully it is. I don't have to read my words, right? See, there was no pest even over here, if you see, right? So just with us taking over, uh, let me go back to 615. We've added... 78 times six is what a little over like close to like five fifty six hundred dollars right we've just added this fee and we're able to get this fee right gives you pet rent concessions this now tells you what the market rent is per unit type what the average is because what we want to discuss is the loss to lease now this is a very powerful thing i'm going to show you guys Did i see this our market rent is 1133 our average rent is 861. This means our lost release on average across the board is $272. Now, let me just zoom in here and you're gonna start realizing why these things become very important. So what we're gonna do, what we wanna understand is what is the maximum revenue opportunity we have? So as an example, if this number was zero, so market rent and average rent were the same, which means market rent, the average rent was 1133 we would be getting an extra $42,687 every month, straight to our bottom line, right? You annualize that number, you multiply it by 12, you find out what is the maximum revenue we're gonna get over the entire year. You know, this is the fun part. You take your annualized revenue opportunity, you divide it by a cap rate, and we, I just put 5.5, the market cap rate is much less, I like to be conservative. It tells you we can just by doing just this one activity, forget about everything else, we can raise the value of the property by an outstanding, I was astounding $9.3 million or $59,321 per unit just by focusing on this opportunity. So I'd like you to understand why these things become so important. Just by focusing on one or two key variables, you've now, if you follow and execute on your business plan, this is money going directly to you or your investors' pockets, right? The other some of the stats, and then I'm going to go down to the real nice juicy part, is I just want to see, we took over in 2022, how is our team performing on the leases we signed versus last year when we weren't around, right? You can see there's a noticeable difference, right? 
then you see, you know, various stats, 2022 versus average, 2021 versus average. What are we looking at here? And then the term part here, right? The term is 46 months over here. If I go right at the start of where I was, right, it was 48. So I'm slowly, slowly, slowly bringing the term down. Now, like I said, guys, there is no magic pill here. There is no, hey, 20 is good and 40 is bad. But what you've got to realize is when you're going through this process, you're aggressively pushing up rents, aggressively renovating, your term is going to go down because a lot of people are going to be disgruntled. They might not like it. But when you are providing a quality product to the market, there are going to be other people lining up to take your product. So it's very, very, very important. Once again, I want to emphasize this to focus on this little line item over here, because suddenly... If you tell your teams with the right product, right approach, in a very short period of time, we can raise our valuation by $9.3 million or $59,321 per unit. That's massive when you consider that we got this property for, I think, $113,000 a unit. That's massive, right? Now, this is where I think the real interesting part comes out. And this is where I think, oh, nope. Uh, this is where... You know how I explained to you that we take our lease beginning and lease end, you know, over here, and we see, we just put it down as a month, year, month, year for lease beginning and lease end, right? This is where this really translates into the opportunity. Now, over here, you realize the maximum opportunity we have is $42,687. But what you want to understand and talk to your team is not just an idealized version. What you want to talk is, say, from June, say right now, to the end of the year, how is your team going to perform? How are you going to measure them? How are you going to take this 42687 And how are you going to chip away at it every single month? What are you going to do about it, right? We're going to talk about this in a second. This is what I want you to understand. When you lay your data out correctly, when you have insights, what you can now understand is by going by lease expiry date, right? You can understand, hey, the average loss to lease that I have per unit type, because this unit type is very important for each month, you know, into the future, right? Is this 412. And, the, you know, the more negative it is, the worse it is. Well, how many of leases are expiring? Because that's very important, right? And the reason why it's important to understand this is because now you understand what your opportunity is. Because all you did is take this minus 412, you multiplied it by three to know that if I took all of the loft units that are coming, I push them to market, I can get $1,235 just by doing that thing, right? So now what you can start seeing is, this is called the climb in financial terminology, right? How am I slowly chipping away? What is my climb? The maximum climb that I have in June is 2,530. July, we've got a lot of leases expiring, right? Say 16 leases. We don't want the, and the reason why over here, this is color coded as red is because suddenly there's a lot of leases expiring. So the other reason what we want to do is manage our rental. We don't want to put our property managers under so much stress that in one or two months, they have the bulk of our revenue coming in, right? Because that puts stress on them, but it's a business risk for us, right? But you can see the previous guy didn't manage his rent role effectively. So we now see that, hey, July, we've got 5,420. So if we just stood in June and we just summed up all of our opportunity from June to December, we can have at least 20,000, some say it's 20,185. 20,185 off this $42,000 opportunity, we can just capitalize on between now and December. So do you understand why this becomes very important? Because you have to have both an idealized target, but you want to have a tactical plan on a week by week, month by month basis. What is that plan? How are you doing it? And how are you going to chip away at a per unit floor plan level, right? Now, if you want to go per unit, let's assume you wanted to go to DO3 for that matter. You also have that plan over here, right? Just want to tell you why this is important. You have the granular data where you can go unit by unit, but then as a manager, you also have a unit floor plan type of data that you can look at, right? Now, this also tells you a lease expiry schedule that we talked about. This tells you the lease expiry schedule by the previous months. Now, the reason for this is some of these leases were signed before we took over. So from here, even though we took over in February, renewals were done, 
all the way till here, right? But from April onwards, we have aggressively raised rent. So even though we bought unit, we bought, we signed leases at the market rent in April, we still pushed their rents in this case, 145, 120. 170, $120, right? Or $70 in this case. So you can see, even compared to the last few months, how aggressively we've been pushing our rents. This just gives me as a manager, very, very, very good intel and data. It also tells me how many leases did we actually sign in those last few months, right? Kind of helps me understand and formulate a plan, both looking forward, but trying assessing the team looking backwards so I can see it in a 360 degree view. All right, so this is managing your rent role. Now, all of this is very good, but how are you gonna get this extra rent? You're gonna ask me, well, well, this is all pretty cool. The other guy might not have been very intelligent, but hey, how are you gonna be intelligent and capitalize on this $272 opportunity? And this is where managing, just managing your CapEx like your hair on fires becomes very important. Now, this is a different property, Brighton Farms. This is Pines of Lanier. This is Brighton Farms. As I told you, I'm going to show you actual data from my various properties, right? So we're going to start here at the top. I'm going to give you a quick rundown, and then we're going to talk about various specific topics, right? Again, you have specific unit numbers because you want to know that. The reason why I have a link to invoices over here as an example, I'm going to show you this. This is going to my actual Google Drive. All right, you see this asset bright and front, da, 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 going to this unit type, right? Because anytime I spend any money, I want to have the invoice with me. I want to be, and I'm going to show you where we put it. I want to be able to go and compare actual costs that go into, say, renovating the uh, unit versus my budget and to see how am I performing. Because it's no good if a manager tells me, hey, we're under budget. Great. How much are we under budget? Where are we under budget on? Where are we over budget? How much did we spend? These are the questions you have to ask. Now, the reason why I have this checkbox over here, it's called the audit status. The reason why this is because one person, it's like, Auditing 101, one person has to do the work, another person has to check the work, right? So we wanna make sure that say, if one of my analysts or property managers is doing the invoices, another person is checking it. Whenever they check it off, this means they are done. Two people have independently done the work, they've checked, and if it doesn't match, then they've gotta go fix this problem, right? Again, we talked about having standardized drop downs, right? So for instance, if we go here on the rent roll, it was just occupied vacant, Pretty simple thing. Here, I have a rent roll for each unit floor plan type. Again, the reason for this is if we don't standardize these items, somebody could write, say, two by one, but not put a space between SR and one, right? You don't want that to happen, right? Just wanted to give you an idea why drop downs exist. We obviously want to know what are the square feet of the each floor plan, right? Then we have a whole bunch of various renovation packages that we're going to implement. In our particular case, the reason why we've chosen predominantly the premium uh, you know, plan for us is because on this property, Brighton Farms, we were able to push rents $600 in like about a year. And the reason why we were able to do this is, again, because we are opportunistic buyers. So when we saw how much ROI we were getting, and I'm going to get into that, we decided, okay, there's no use being cheap because you have, again, the data has to speak, right? Because you might have one plan, but if you see, hey, if I just put in an extra little, say $500, I might get an additional $200 juice on my rent. Well, that's an ROI you should take all day, every day. So when the data speaks to you, you can go in, understand with dispassionate analysis, basically, right? Then you're able to push this initial plan was to do a standard by, or mix the standard and classic. We were getting such high ROI because we order in bulk, we were getting good pricing, pushed everything to premium, got a lot of juice out of this, right? Now, status, again, this is basically a standardized list because it's very important to standardize as much as possible, right? Completed, on hold, you can see this. Um, hold on, let me, uh, yeah, no, it's not going to change right here. But it just shows you that I have a standardized list. And as people complete various tasks, as you can see, there's going to be a bunch of them. Hold on, let me go here. Oh, I know why this is. Hold on, data, let's remove filter. You see, I've got a whole bunch of these various unit types that are color coded differently before, because I have all of these. Therefore, I'm able to see all of this stuff. That kind of makes sense, right? Now, what we're going to do is I'm going to convert this to completed because that's going to show you uh, the correct picture, actually. 
but there's a lot more depth to this. Now, this is something that I always emphasize to my team. Uh, this is obviously an area of improvement for us. We have been getting better at it every month. So this is something that we, this is an obvious area of improvement, but I do, we, we do track this. So the reason why this is important is think about the life cycle when somebody say, says, okay, my lease is expiring. I'm kind of done. Think about that life cycle from the day they move out to the day you lease back that unit. So there's a couple of steps there, right? Assuming you want to renovate the unit, somebody moves out, then you have a renovation start date, you have a renovation end date, and then you have a lease start date, the new lease start date. And ideally, you want to compress this time as much as possible, because even though you might get more rent, you're also losing out on rent the longer this property or this unit rather stays vacant, right? This is a big area. We've actually had to learn. We've had to pivot because of COVID, lots of reasons. Just want to tell you why this is important and why this is an area that we're diligently improving on. Right now, over here, as you can see, I just track the various days. Now, this is unacceptable, this 38 day time frame, but we were getting a lot of juice. And again, we're getting better at it. But what I want to show you here is you're going to understand budgeted versus actual cost. Now, our budget is one thing, our actual cost is something else. And you're going to realize, guys, there's going to green is good and red is bad, obviously. You're not going to win every single battle. Okay, it's just not going to happen. Right in this unit, I remember the tenant basically this was like a war zone. So we just had to go, even though our budget said 79.15, we just had to go spend a lot of money on this, right? So I'm showing you the good and the bad. But the, the issue here is that you have to basically look at it dispassionately. You're not going to win every single battle. So here we saved $49,000. Now we're going to lose $7,200 compared to our budget, right? So can I help? it really helps you to understand actual costs versus budgeted costs. And then whether, hey, you're up or down on your costs. Then this is a real meat and potatoes, guys. What is your before reno rent or before renovation rent? And what rent did you get after you reno? And by the way, again, you're not going to win every single battle, right? You see this red over here? Not going to win every single battle right? But you have to see on average, how are you performing on pure dollars? How much rent bump did I get per month? But also as an ROI, hey, what is my return on investment for doing all of this thing, right? So we go as high as 287. But we've also, quote unquote, for this particular one, lost 21% ROI, right? It was a lost opportunity because our rent actually went down. But you see on the whole, the greens are more than the reds. And as a manager, you've got to focus on ensuring that your ship is heading in the right direction not going to win every single battle, right? So it's very, very, very important to have all of these details because it's no you good, no you saying, hey, I bumped my rents up by $130 as an example. If you ended up spending $20,000, look at this. If you ended up spending $20,000 on this because now your ROI has gone to 8%, right? Got to keep these things in mind. And then, as I mentioned, you manage your rental, you manage your renovation process, but now you've leased all these units and bad stuff starts happening. Bad debt starts accumulating. What do you do? Now what you do over here is you start tracking this on a day by day by day basis for this one property, right? So you can see this not just say on the end of the month, how much bad debt did I have, but on a monthly, on a daily basis, how much did I have? Because now you can start tracking. Let's assume you get to the middle of the month, right? You can see, hey, how did I perform compared to last few months? Right? You need to have this data when you're having this meeting with your managers, because it's no use if they say they've leased up the property, but now your bad debt doesn't really help you. Right? So you've got to track this on a daily basis across all months. Right? And again, we've got these tutorial videos in case somebody wants to see them. Not going to bore you with details, but this just tells you what we're looking at. And these line graphs kind of give us an idea of how my various months are performing. Right? Now you've understood the rental. You've understood the CapEx. You've understood why and how on a daily basis we track our bad debt. Now your P&L comes into play, right? So you've got this really cool, fancy budget. I'm going to go over here, right? The budget of P&L you've agreed to with your property manager, right? Now actual numbers have to start coming in, right? So you have to see, okay, this is how I'm performing in each month. But that's not the end of the story because if you just stopped here, that's, I mean, that's just numbers. It could be, one, it says 151, it could be 161, it could be 200. It, the number doesn't matter. What matters is 
What is your ratios? And how do you compare against your budget? Because all of this is leading up to something, right? All the work we've done. So now you start comparing your ratios over here, right? In this property, it's a big, heavy lift. Because when we took over, it was a war zone from leaking or non-existent roofs to basically floors just collapsing. And we've been able to do all of this stuff for about $1.1 million, push the value up by about 80% in less than a year and a half, right? So now you start tracking various stats. Hey, how is my vacancy doing? How is my loss to lease doing? How is my bad debt doing? How are we operating on an OPEX basis? What are we doing? How much are our non-renovated rents? How much are our renovated rents? And there's a whole bunch of these details. But the reason why you need to have this much amount of the granularity, guys, is because all of the stuff that we discussed earlier, they actually translate into all of these individual line items that you see here. But the biggest thing you're going to see is you're going to have a variance. Because what you want to eventually, at the end of the day, do is have a target, which is your budget. And now your actual numbers are where the rubber meets the road. Right? So how are you going to compare? So you could see, for instance, hey, my gross potential rent, in this case, compared to budget, I was down by 1,160. Now, if you just looked at the headline number, you might freak out and be like, wow, so we're not doing really good, right? But now you start comparing. Okay, your vacancy, you're doing much better on vacancy. On your bad debt, you're doing much better. So net-net on just total rental revenue, you're up by $3,268 for the month of May, but you were down 11405 for the month of April, right? How are we doing on other income? Are we consistently pushing? There's going to be lumpiness in this, but you want to look at it actuals versus budget, right? How do we do on our operating expenses? And lastly, how do we compare on our net operating income? Because that's what really matters at the end of the day. So even though you can see there's a lot of volatility, negatives and positives, at the end of the day, we are still up, gosh, what is it, 252000 even though we had this one negative month versus budget, not in absolute, just in versus budget, we are still up for the year. We're up 124106 right? So I got to change this to maybe go to two, right? 124106 So you can see with all this volatility, all of the stuff that we're managing, this is now translating into your profit and loss, now translating into your net operating income. And this is basically what happens. But what you've got to realize is we have all of this stuff. We discuss all of this stuff. But as some of our investors know, you know, if you're on our list, you're on our mobile app, we get a lot of property updates because numbers are one thing, but pictures, videos, these things are very important. So I want to relay to you an example of how all of the stuff that we've done, how it actually translates into real life by having the right team. You know, I was checking up on the progress of a property. In fact, it was, it was the Equinox at night, the picture, the beautiful property that we pictured over here. I was checking up on the property as I usually do. I come, I go there unannounced. I don't tell the team that I'm showing up and I was filming some of the renovations. I was interviewing our property managers. Uh, we just want to be present and hands-on, right? And your staff needs to know that as well, right? And But we also want to be transparent with our investors. So anyways, I was at the property. This lady, this old lady keeps wanting to be in the videos because I'm big on like recording videos because I think it's just way, way, way easier, right? And she wants to hug Amanda and she wants to be on camera and give us a testimonial. So I'm in the video. I humor her. I laugh. There's a really nice lady, right? But after we shot off the video, a thought occurred to me. I was like, yeah, but you, you, don't, you don't even live here. Like, what's up? And she said, I know, but I love Amanda so much that I love coming back every couple of weeks just to hang out with her and bring her flowers, right? So what's the point? The point isn't that this isn't just a business, guys, about raising rents for people who live and work in the area. This lady, she came back. She doesn't even live in the area anymore, by the way, right? Why did she do this? Unfortunately, I don't have like a 16-point like a checklist or some model that's going to explain to you what happened. The only reason that I can tell you she came back is because Amanda is a good, kind person who treated her like a human being. And not just that, we empowered Amanda to take those decisions, right? So you're going to say, oh, yeah, kind of obvious. You don't have to give me this thing. But it's not obvious because most people don't hire for empathetic people. And if they do hire for them, they don't empower empathetic people. So if you don't empower people to act in an empathetic way, they don't value, and then you don't value them enough to give them good money. Because at the end of the day, if you don't give them a good salary, none of this stuff matters. 
So if you think about it, for those that care about this kind of thing, there is an extremely powerful lesson in that. Okay. Now I'm going to go in, tell you about the meeting schedule. We're going to wrap this up. The meeting schedule, as you can see, I like to have one big all hands on deck meeting with the onsite property managers, the regional, the CFOs. Once a week, we go through all the checklist items. Then I have my analysts and my team check in and I have them time the meeting because long meetings are the work of the devil, right? Nothing ever gets done, right? So I have them time. They cannot have a meeting more than 10 minutes, three times a week with the property managers, just checking with them, guiding them what's going to happen, all of this sort of stuff. Now, just want to explain to you what happens when you do all of these renos, right? You take properties that look on the front, on the top half of the screen, and you convert them into stellar properties on the bottom half of the screen, right? A couple of big case, couple of case studies. This is Equinox at night. We bought this property at 23.9 million in December, 2019. Our valuation right now is $41.7 million. We have strategically refinanced into long-term debt. We returned 42% of the initial equity back to investors in 20 months. All of our investors are on the project now. They get double digit. Even in this environment, they get a double digit cash on cash in a fast appreciating submarket. So all the work, guys, that we do in rental management, capex management, delinquency management, managing our PL, you can see this as a real live example of what what basically what happens. Because at the end of the day, we gotta make money, right? 